Welcome. On behalf of the entire Gardening for Life Project team, I just want to say welcome. We are so excited that each and every one of you are here, and we're excited to welcome folks who are live streaming from home. Uh, this is such a big day, and there's so many people that have helped to make it happen. I'm going to give you a quick short story, and then we're going to let Doug take the show. This idea of this event started almost a year ago when a member of our community saw a Zoom, a, a webinar, and they're like, hi, I'm a gardener, I know this stuff, and they got on a Zoom call and they watched Doug Tallamy give a presentation, and it was a light bulb moment for this woman. It was like, I've been gardening my whole life and I did not know that there's a better way to do it. And so she walked away from that call going, we got to bring Doug to town, like that simple, like we got to bring Doug to town. So fast forward almost a year and you can see how many people have been involved in making this happen. The Congregational Church stepped in right off the bat and said, we can help, we can help make this happen. Conserving Carolina has been a tremendous partner with this. Again, we can help make this happen. Lanier Library in town, we've had so many partners. Weiler Woods for Wildlife, Carolina Native, New View Realty, and you've seen a bunch more of our sponsors. I wish I could thank everyone. That, along with over 60 volunteers, Rotary, et cetera, et cetera, we're super excited. Our hope is that this is the beginning of the conversation and that you all walk away like the woman that started this whole thing with a light bulb moment today after hearing what Doug has to share. A lot of you know who Doug is. I'm just not going to give him a big introduction because I think most of you know his story. We're so pleased to have him here. Please join me in welcoming Doug Tallamy. Well, thank you, Corey. She's, she's good. I think she should give this talk. I don't know how many light bulbs we're going to do today, but um, I'm going to tell you a story, uh, and it's about my idea of what nature's best hope is. But I'll give you a spoiler. You are nature's best hope. So what I'm really going to tell you about is why I think you are nature's best hope, why I actually know you're nature's best hope. But before we talk about that, let's talk about what E.O. Wilson's idea of nature's best hope is. Um, he was a very famous professor at, at Harvard. Uh, he, he wrote a book every year, and I think he was writing a book when he died at the age of, of 93. Uh, and it was the day after Christmas two years ago. So huge loss to the world of conservation. But one thing that was consistent throughout his very long career was his life, his love of life on, on planet Earth. He loved biodiversity, uh, and he spent most of his career trying to save it. Uh, not just because he loved it, but because he knew it was essential to human survival. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Our Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. If we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, including human life, we have to save nature. We have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. And he spent most of the book talking about the, the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He did not spend a lot of time telling us uh, how we were going to save life on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biologist, that's, that's good news. We'll just, you know, a lot of things are disappearing. We'll put them all in one half, and, and it'll be great, and we'll all be in the other half. Problem is, um, we have, well, half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture, and we've got 8 billion people in the other half, along with all of our, our uh, roads and airports and detritus, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So, a lot of people wondering, how can we actually re realize E.O. Wilson's dream? And that's really what I want to talk about today. I think we can. But we need a new approach to conservation in order to do it. Before we talk about that, let's talk about what happened on the East Coast in 2019. We had a very large oak mast. Members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. That's what it looked like at, in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns. <laughs> And I just stared at it. But I was rewarded, because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First it chewed a little hole for its head, then it forced its head through there, then it forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze. Finally plopped down. That's a dangerous time for this insect larva. 
because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. It takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa. And then surprisingly, stays in that underground chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down there at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts, chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole, and that is how the larva gets into the acorn. Why do they spend two years underground? Want to think about the very next year? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they leave the acorn, it leaves a hole, kind of like a true vacuum, and you know that, that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she's filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants that live in the holes made by acorn weevils after they have left the acorns. The entire colony lives in there, and if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn's falling apart. So they tell everybody, it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn. That takes about 30 minutes. And then they post a guard, make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until that acorn starts to disintegrate. So what's my point with, with this very simple story? Well, that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn and they'll fly up to a mile, although I read a few, few weeks ago, a mile and a half. A good distance from the parent tree, then they tap that acorn beneath the soil surface and the object is they're gonna go back uh, in, in the winter time and have something to eat. And they can bury a lot of acorns, up to 4,500 acorns for each J. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. <laughs> so for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. And oaks have, have evolved to depend on that level of dispersal. Specialized relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So if you don't have a lot of carpenter ants, you won't have pileated woodpeckers. Uh, and, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That is the only plant, the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We've got about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all day, all week, all year about nature specialized relationships. Uh, the point I wanna make this afternoon though is that these relationships, nature itself uh, is now on the ropes. And it's on the ropes largely because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we did not leave the lower 48 states uh, as it was. For the most part, there's only about 5% that's uh, anything close to its original pristine ecological condition, and those are typically mountaintops. And that's because we've logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it, we have drained it, we have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland, four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cows. And of course, we've, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and damped them, and you can spell that any way you want. <laughs> we have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other, other countries. Many of them are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need them to sustain because that is what keeps us alive on planet Earth. So you might wonder why we've done all that. I wonder why we've done all that and I don't know, but I suspect we thought that, that our nest, planet Earth, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines on a regular basis now, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America's lost three billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. 
Not a prediction, it's already happened. This is a prediction. The UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years, and they said it two years ago, so now I guess it's the next 18 years. Um, you know, it makes a nice headline, but uh, it is not an option, folks. Those are the species that keep us alive. We have to take this seriously, and we have to make sure that does not happen. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses. That's not what this talk is about. This talk's about a cure for that pox. A cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and me, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if we lost if Earth were to lose insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very simple. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrate animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, and our mammals, those food webs would collapse and those animals would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here uh, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape in order to do that. Why is that? Uh, well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on every day, like oxygen. Plants are producing that oxygen. They're cleaning our water, slowing its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use, capturing carbon, enormously important today. Plants, of course, build their tissues out of the carbon that they take from carbon dioxide after they pulled it out of the atmosphere. They build their tissues out of that carbon, but then they also pump the extra carbon that they harness through photosynthesis into the ground through their root systems. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. And once it's in the soil, it's extremely stable. It can stay there for thousands of years. Plants are building topsoil, holding it in place. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather. They're converting sunlight into food. If we lose our plants, we're gonna to have to eat sunlight. And that'll be a real IT problem. <laughs> what are animals doing for plants? Lots of things, but here's some important ones. They provide pest control services. They're keeping our plants from being all eaten up. They're pollinating nearly 90% of the flowering plants. They're dispersing plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services, just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because of those eight billion people that are on the planet demanding more and more ecosystem services every single day. Now we do have parks, we do have preserves, they're doing the best they can, but it's obviously not good enough because we are now in the sixth great extinction event that the planet has ever experienced, which means we're going to have to start practicing conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like that. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that, that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth, and Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the planet than it has to, has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Otto Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed that we were capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic, and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac, his most famous book. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I, I suspect that the notion that humans and nature cannot live together, that we cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, 
That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Elder Leopold's day, and unfortunately, still with us, still embedded in our own culture, that he might not have recognized it as an option. So another message I have today is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every year, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, back to private property. Most of the country is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. When I use the word conservation, I'm not really using it correctly. We do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left out there, absolutely. Uh, but I'm really talking about putting back together again all those, those pieces of nature that we've dismantled. I'm talking about restoration. And before you tell me, well, there's no way you're going to put it back the way it was before we, we wrecked it, um, I, I know that. But we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions so that we have functioning ecosystems again, even if it's not exactly what was on that space at some point in the past. But to do that, we need to start with the building blocks. Not every species contributes to ecosystem function equally, so we have to start with the most powerful species. And there's two groups that we can't do with that. One is the flowering plants, and of course the pollinators that allow those plants to, to reproduce. They are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into the simple sugars and carbohydrates that are the food, that is the food that supports just about all the, plant, the animals on the planet. So now the, the food that supports our animals is stored in plant parts, largely leaves. Well, it turns out that most, most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat something else that ate plants directly, and it typically is an invertebrate, typically insects, and not just any insect. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, that is the chickadee that you have right here, but all the chickadees around the country are, are uh, doing pretty much the same thing. They're the birds at our feeder all winter long, eating seeds, and we tend to think that's all chickadees need. Uh, but in fact, even in the wintertime, only 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. And when it comes time for them to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So no more seeds. Um, they switch entirely to invertebrates, and if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not alone. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that one of my uh, grad students did a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to bird photographers across the country, maybe some of you participated in this, and said, please take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they're carrying food to the nest. Send those pictures to me, Ashley. I will identify the prey items that are in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as I can. And it was very successful. She got thousands of pictures, did a lot of identifying. And what you're looking at is a summary of her results for the 20 most common bird families in North America. The green bars are the percentage of those bird families, a percentage of the nestling diet that was caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen if we designed landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars in them? Most of our birds would not be able to successfully reproduce. So it seems there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars, and one of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. <laughs> the thin wrapper is his exoskeleton. It's made of chitin, it's undigestible, and because they're soft, you can stuff the caterpillar down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring it. <laughs> and if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. The beak's like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller uh, birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? 
They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other types of insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. And a lot of beetles have very sharp edges too. And finally, it turns out that the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate, and birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from, particularly during the breeding season? Well, all those prey items are bringing back to the nest. But look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey. The first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars. Here, the moths and butterflies themselves, they have fewer carotenoids because they're not eating the green leaves. That's where the carotenoids come from. And way over here is the earthworm. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. <laughs> so that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of most bird diets. They are essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? That's a good question. So let's go back to chickadees. There's a lot of data on Carolina chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of Carolina chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on how many chicks are in the nest, to get those chicks to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to get a nest of chickadees to the point of independence. And of course, after they ind they're independent, they continue to eat caterpillars. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you, you do, because in so many places, that's all we have left is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees and most birds only forage a short distance from the nest. For chickadees, it's about 50, 50 meters. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not include all of those caterpillars, all of those insects, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like that's one of the major factors associated with the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the species of birds that require insects, typically when they're breeding, and the species of birds that do not require insects when they're breeding. So things like uh, doves and finches can actually, uh, they can reproduce on seeds. They make a little milk out of the seed and feed that to their, their young. And look, those birds, the birds that do not require insects didn't lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years. But the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. It doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. So we need to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to do one thing, be pretty. Now we have to ask them to do two things, be pretty and ecologically functional at the same time. A little bit harder, but it's a fun, it's a fun new challenge. Well, it's not, they're not gonna be ecologically functional unless we add caterpillars to our landscape. So how do you do that? Well, you add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. That seems easy enough, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. Fussy about which plants we choose, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. It's not an exception, by the way. It's just like 90% of the other insects that are out there. But you can have all the crepe myrtle and all the camellias and all the hostas and all the ginkgos and all the privets and all the burning bush and all the barberries and all the things we typically landscape with, all the bamboo, all the English ivy, in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's gonna make a monarch butterfly is one of our milkweeds. Um, that's called host plant specialization. Uh, and again, most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists, just like the monarch. Why? Why are they so specialized? Well, plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they try to defend their tissues. They load their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter 
were downright toxic. Uh, and it's a really effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no, no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of those plants. They are too well protected. There's a reason it's hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know they're toxic. <laughs> but how do insects? We know insects eat plants. How do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Again, 90% of the insects that eat plants are just like that monarch butterfly. They can only eat the plants for which they have specialized adaptations that allow them to get around those chemical defenses, circumvent them. They develop specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of exposure to the plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. So if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace it with hostas, the monarch's not gonna start to make a living on hostas. It can't do it. It's locked into milkweeds. So if that's the case, they have, they have two choices. Fly away and find milkweed someplace else if they can, or starve to death. Turns out that uh, this is actually very easy. There are three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs. Remember, plants are capturing energy from the sun. They're gonna pass it on so that we have other living things on the planet. And there are plants that are really good at doing them. We call that contributors. There are plants that don't contribute energy to local food webs. And then there's plants that actively detract energy from local food webs. Best contributor in, in the US is one of our oaks. It is the top contributor in 84% of the counties in which it occurs, contributing more energy to food webs than any other type of plant. A good example of a non-contributor uh, would be a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. It's a pretty ornamental, it's a nice, nice fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo, so it's not adding any energy to the local food web. And a great example of a detractor would be our friend the calorie pear. Um, not only do things not eat calorie pear, but of course it escapes and pushes out the native plants that do contribute energy. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters, folks. If we're going to rebuild the food webs that support the ecosystems that we're trying to restore, we've got to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. And I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants, starting with uh, my house. My wife always wants to say our house. <laughs> <laughs> She does live there, too. <laughs> Our house in Oxford, Pennsylvania, um, where we got uh, a farm was being broken, broken up into 10-acre lots, uh, and we got one of those lots in the year 2000. <clears throat> it had been mowed for hay before we, we moved in. Um, so, of course, when you mow for hay, you're really mowing all the rootstocks of the invasive plants that have been there. And when you stop mowing, they all grow back. So the first thing we had to do was control the invasives on the property. But then we wanted to restore the life that uh, ought to be on that piece of land. And again, you're not going to do that without putting the caterpillars back. Uh, so one of my early choices to see if I could get uh, a caterpillar living at my house that wasn't there before was the Canadian owlet. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet. It's a pretty little thing. People say, why would you choose the Canadian owlet? Because I was looking through Dave Wagner's Caterpillars of Eastern North America I said, that's a pretty one. <laughs> that's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, you're not going to have Canadian alice unless you have meadow rue. It is the only plant that they eat, host plant specialization, just like uh, monarchs and milkweeds. And we didn't have any meadow rue. Um, this was a very old farm that was broken. It had been farmed almost 300 years. I'm sure there was meadow rue there 300 years ago, but uh, no longer. So I got some seeds of meadow rue some, someplace and planted them, and they grew very nicely. But this was early on, and I actually had very little faith that um, Canadian outlets would be able to find my little patch of, of meadow rue. So I didn't even go out and check it after I planted them. Uh, maybe two months later, I was walking by for another reason. I looked over. It was covered with Canadian outlets. I'm still surprised about that, but they had found it right away. Uh, so now we have a good population of meadow rue and Canadian outlets on our property. We've added two species that didn't used to be there. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's actually a, a misnomer. A beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. Um, we didn't have any Biden's aristosa. Uh, so, uh, but I did know where there was some Biden's in a power line cut 
about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. As a matter of fact, last year they took over my, my front yard. That's okay. Um, but I had to wait a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my Bidens. They finally did, and now we've got a good population of both of those. So we've added four species to the property now. Same story with the hackberry emperor. I wanted the hackberry emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly, but because it belongs there. It's one of the species that should be occurring on our property. But like its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry, on celtus, and we didn't have any hackberry. So I planted, uh, I guess, four hackberry trees. It took four years for the hackberry emperor to find my hackberry trees, but they did. Uh, and now we have populations of those, so now I've added six species, and that is how the restoration proceeded. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the assidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't come to my goldenrod yet, but it's still part of the fun. There's its, its beautiful caterpillars. It's anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. <laughs> Every year I go out and I look for those, those caterpillars. One of these years I'm going to find it, and that'll be a great year. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. Talked about it with, with a few people on this trip so far. It's a great native plant. Um, for some reason, people don't, don't like it, but uh, it does everything. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's lightweight, so it really doesn't pull them down. It's a good ground cover. It's got great fall color. Uh, it makes valuable berries for the birds in the fall. By valuable, I mean they are high in fat. That's what migrating birds need. Fat has twice the energy that, that uh, sugar has in it. Uh, and the birds that don't migrate, the, the residents are spending the winter, need high fat berries as well, so they can build up their fat reserves to get through the winter. Uh, it's a good pollinator plant. It has tiny little inconspicuous flowers. You don't even know it's in bloom until you see that big cloud of native bees around it. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I planted Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that are a primary con, uh, component of cardinal diets when they're feeding their young. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I wanted to see if I could get the double tooth prominent at our house just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Looks like a stegosaurus. <laughs> Even if you don't like caterpillars, you have to like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm. And of course, we didn't have any American elm. We lost our elms to Dutch, Elms, elm, Dutch elm disease decades ago. But there are two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make a lot of seeds. So uh, maybe the second year after we moved in, I gathered up some of those seeds out of the gutter, planted them at home. They germinate in six days. They grow very fast. Those trees are now 80 feet tall. And they brought in the double tooth prominent, another big success. American elm. I wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Uh, well, as its name implies, it needs evening primrose, and we didn't have any evening primrose, believe it or not. So I planted it, Enothera. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, <laughs> but it's always very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, these are just examples of the plants that we put back on our property. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. That is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local food web, you can enjoy it right away, the very first year. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two-foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to call in the moths that made the caterpillars that run the, the food web at my house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, the uh, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, 
the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of caterpillars have come to the oaks on my property. I know that the oaks appreciate that you are clapping for them, and I clap for them too. And they come right away. This is the pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves, and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to support your food webs. It will do it immediately. Now, this is what our, our house looks like, actually what it looked like before the Bidens took over my front yard. The point is we put plants back. Not all the plants, still working on it. Um, but in the last 20 years, my research has shown that if you know the number of species of moths, not butterflies, but moths, in your local food web, it's a very good index of the stability and productivity, the value of that particular food web. So five years ago, I made it a challenge, took on the challenge of, of uh, taking a picture of every species of moth that is now making a living uh, at, at my house on my property, our property. And I'm up to 1,199 species so far. Not done yet. Uh, last year I added 100 more species. So there's a lot of things living there now because we put the plants back. Now we do have 10 acres. Uh, Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we're supporting 44% of the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of those are types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. I don't know who you're clapping for for that, but that's great. <laughs> Why am I telling you that? This is another headline that we see all the time. Uh, Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic. Uh, but I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I'm convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? We really could turn these terrible statistics around. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres. Does it work on smaller properties in, let's say, suburbia? That's a very good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, where they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Uh, and they're in the middle of a, a, a typical neighborhood. All their, their neighbors have the big lawns. When they moved in, their house was choked with Almer honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, another, another invasive from Asia. So the first thing they did was get rid of all of that. Then they planted 70 species of native plants. Then they put in a water feature and they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their, their property. And they are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. If any of you were birders, you know that's a very good number. Just to compare that to what we've seen at our house, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it uh, work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, right on the other side of that wall there is O'Hare Airport. She has one tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. She's not connected to any natural area at all. It's a pretty one-tenth of an uh, acre because she's a native plant landscaper and she's good at it. But it's an island. It's a tiny little island in the middle of Chicago. But she did the same thing. She took out her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature, and then she sat back and she says, with a glass of wine, <laughs> and started to count the birds that are using her property. And she's up to 124 bird species, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there's four things we need to think about if we're gonna succeed in a big way, and, and we wanna succeed in a big way. And of course, first thing you have to do is address those big lawns. We've got 44 million acres of lawn dedicated to an ecological deadscape. That's an area bigger than, the, uh, than all of New England combined. And of course, we do that because lawn is a status symbol. So I understand that. And we also need to uh, display our Halloween decorations. <laughs> but what if we were to cut the area of lawn in half? Now notice I am not saying get rid of lawn, your lawn. I'm just saying reduce it, cut it in half. What if we took places like this and we turned them into this? I got this picture from Dan Getman in Missouri. I've never met Dan, but he had this big lawn and he said, look, I'm doing it, I'm putting the plants back. And he sent me this picture. 
Well, let's make the math simple. Let's say we've got 40 million acres of lawn. We cut that in half. That'll give us 20 million acres that we can restore right where we live. We can create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? What do we get when we put some part of nature right where we live? We get the opportunity to develop a personal, close-up relationship with that part of nature, that part of Mother Nature. We can do it at our own time, our own pace. We can avoid, you know, maybe all you have to do is go outside, but maybe all you have to do is look out the window and you can develop that, that relationship. You can avoid crowds. If you go to a real national park, 375 million people were there last year, so I know what you're really going to have a relationship with. It's free. There's no, no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. You can avoid travel hassles. Uh, you get to experience the natural world alone, which to me is essential to developing that personal relationship, just you and Mother Nature, not mediated by somebody else. And it's particularly important for our poor kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a, with a teacher and they drive for an hour and they walk around a natural area for an hour and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home and that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing, but it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and get to know it again, at their own pace, their own time, alone, no parental supervision. When we hover over our kids, we are sending the message that this is dangerous stuff. This is something that you should fear. And of course, they hear that from the media all the time. That is the wrong message to be sending to the future stewards of the planet. We want them to love stewarding. We don't want them to be afraid of it. And if they don't, they're going to be lousy stewards. And we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they'll learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, <laughs> who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a little piece of lawn and a hedge, but there are no lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe in all seriousness how you catch lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks <laughs> so the lizards can't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard no smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard. You catch the lizard. You put it in an aquarium. You learn how to take care of that lizard. You learn how to be a good steward of that piece of nature. You fall in love with that piece of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but I guarantee she's going to remember doing that uh, in Hawaii the rest of her life. And, and I guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet because of those early experiences. Uh, if you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of how to expose kids to the natural world. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it now. Go to our, our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and register your property on the map. Free doesn't cost anything. All you have to do is put down your location and the amount of area you're going to be a good steward of. Or maybe you're already being a good steward. Maybe you're going to actually shrink part of your lawn. That'd be great. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to put an aster in a flower pot. It all counts. So you put that area on the map and then your little piece of your county is going to light up. You get to see who else in your county is a member of Homegrown National Park. You're going to be part of the effort to get the message that everybody not just tree huggers, but everybody across the nation, actually across the world, is a, they are the critical component, the future of, of conservation. We want that message to go viral. What are we asking? We are asking people to, to reduce lawn. It doesn't contribute anything ecologically to our ecosystems. Uh, and a great idea to increase the, the percentage of natives on your yard. Remove the invasives. Now, most people do have invasive plants on their property. And I've been driving around here. <laughs> I've seen a few. <laughs> so remember, 85% of the country east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we all got rid of the invasives on our private properties, we'd be 85% done. 
And then the seed rain down on our, our public places would be far, far less. And if you're protecting any natural areas, you certainly want to continue to do that. Uh, there are distinct ecological benefits to homegrown national park. You're going to increase biodiversity. And what's happened at, at uh, our house is uh, a great example of that. And it's not very hard, and it doesn't take that long. There will be a measurable reduction in invasive species if we all actually remove them from our properties. And if we convert lawn into plantings like this, that's going to be a significant drawdown of CO2. Remember, lawn is actually adding carbon uh, to the atmosphere all the time. Uh, so we're going to help climate change when we put these plants back in our yard. We're going to start to transform areas outside of parks and preserves into viable habitat. Right now, it's no man's land. But if we create viable habitat outside of our protected areas on private property, then all the populations within those protected areas will be better off. There are uh, sociological products as well, national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solution is. We want to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature uh, is not optional, it's essential. And because everybody requires it, everybody has responsibility for helping to sustain it. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is great, but action's even better. And we're going to merge all the successful conservation efforts that are already happening on private properties uh, by uh, members of National Wildlife Federation or Audubon or Sierra Club or Wild Ones. All these people are doing great things, but we want to record it all on a single map so that we can have a very good measure of how well we're doing. You know the 30-30 the initiative? We're going to save 30% of the earth by 2030. 30% of the U.S. by 2030. Um, we're never going to meet that goal if we don't record successful conservation on most of the land of, of the country. So we are going to uh, shrink the lawn. We're going to join Homegrown National Park. What plants should we put in the spaces where we take lawn out of? I'm going to argue that some of them have to be what I call keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is? It's the stone in the middle of the arch, the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the Roman arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that hold up that house. They're the support system, they're essential. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last 100 years. You're not through building your house when you have your keystone plants, but it's an essential first step. So the question is no longer simply, are native plants ecologically better than, than non-native plants? On average, they certainly are, but there's a lot of native plants that, that aren't contributing all that much either. So the question really is, do we want to use liberally the best contributors, the ones that are supporting the most pollinators and the most caterpillars, or not? What is supporting the most caterpillars? Again, it's one of the oak trees um, in the mid-Atlantic states. They support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that. And if you want to know uh, what the very best plants are in your county, I guess Polk County or wherever you came from, go to Native Plant Finder and National Wildlife Federation website and put in your zip code uh, and the rank list of both the woody and herbaceous plants that are best in your county will pop up. This is just an abbreviated list uh, because I, I ran out of room. Um, so, you know, the, the oaks are way up there, native cherries are way up there, native willows, elms, all those guys are always at the top. Let's look at the, the top herbaceous plants, though. Goldenrods, native asters, perennial sunflowers, they're always way up there. Not only are they best at making uh, a caterpillars, goldenrods support 110 species of caterpillars, by the way, but they're also best at supporting the specialist bees that I mentioned early on. If you're making a pollinator garden, you want to focus on the plants that support the specialist bees because the generalist bees can use those plants as well. If you only plant for the generalist bees and not the specialist, you're going to lose all those specialists, and that's more than 1,000 species. So goldenrod, asters, and, and uh, helianthus in this area will, will allow you to support more than 40 species of specialist bees on your property that wouldn't be there if you don't have those plants. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to use keystone plants liberally. Um, and we're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard. And then we're going to kill them with our security light, <laughs> which is not the goal. 
A lot of research, much of it coming out of Europe, showing that light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect decline around the country. And these are all the ways that lights are killing our, our insects, um, especially those night flying moths that are creating the, the caterpillars that run our, our food webs. This is good news to me, believe it or not, because we have to not just stop insect declines, we've got to turn it around. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects on the planet. Not acceptable. We've got to turn that around. If we can turn it around by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. There are a lot of switches to flick, but we're good switch flickers. But I know what you're going to say. Well, gee, I can't, I can't uh, turn the light out over my garage or my barn or my front porch because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna recognize, the bad man does not come very often. And if you don't wanna do that, take the white bulb. This is the easiest thing. Take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow LED, yellow incandescent. You can get them at your, your hardware store. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than are white wavelengths. So if we were to switch out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, Without turning out our lights, we would save millions of insects, and if we use LEDs, millions of dollars as well. So we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to use keystone plants, we're going to modify our light system, then we're going to invite one of the mosquito fogging companies to come kill all of our insects. <laughs> this is a booming business around the country. And they say it's okay, because what they're fogging is a natural product. And it is. It's pyrethroids, which is an insecticide developed by chrysanthemums. Um, and it's industrial strength pyrethroid. But they say it's a natural product, so that makes it okay. You know, cyanide is a natural product too. <laughs> Ricin is a natural product. Nature makes a lot of very nasty natural products, so I'm not sure that's a good argument. They also say it only kills mosquitoes, and I wish they were right. But in fact, it kills all the insects it comes in contact with, which is all the insects, including all the pollinators we just tried to save, including the monarchs. There's a big monarch kill when they flew through Mosquito Joe two years ago. Hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. The interesting thing is, the ironic thing is, it does not control mosquitoes. I.e., we are doing this for nothing. Why doesn't it control mosquitoes? It's targeting adult mosquitoes. Extremely difficult to control adult mosquito populations. You have to kill 90% of them to do that. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50%, so not even close to, to actually uh, controlling those populations. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. And using mosquito dunks as a biocontrol effort is a great way to do it. You get a bucket, you fill it full of water, you put in a handful of, of, of straw or hay or maybe some dead grass, maybe a few leaves, and let it ferment uh, in the sun for a couple of days. What you're doing is building up the populations of diatoms and algae, and that is what mosquito larvae eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to any female mosquito in your yard that wants to lay her eggs. She will lay her eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks, $12. That's Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a natural bacterium, uh, and this, this formulation only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic diptera in your bucket are mosquito larvae. If a dragonfly gets in there, not going to hurt it a bit. If your dog drinks it, not going to hurt it. You might put a coarse screen over it so the chipmunk doesn't commit suicide. <laughs> but it's cheap, it's targeted, uh, and if everybody did it, it, it would work. This works too, you know. If you, if you have a party in your backyard and you've got some mosquitoes, get some fans, turn them on, it creates a breeze, and the mosquitoes don't fly into that. So you can actually enjoy your yard without killing anything. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do is to design landscapes that allow caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? This is just an example, uh, but I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. Some of them, a few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from the tree, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species finish growing as caterpillars on the tree, and then they drop from the tree. And they try to wiggle their way underneath the ground, and they will pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. It's messy. And we mow and compact the area under our, our trees so that they are rock hard, particularly in the summertime. 
which means the caterpillars can't get underground, which means we've created an ecological trap. If we put the, the attractive plants in our yard, and I do want us to do that, the moths come in, lay their eggs, caterpillars develop and drop down and die. And I am convinced that this is another uh, major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course, the cement landscape is not the answer either. Now, this is what most people do. You have a tree in a yard. I've got a new grad student this year who's measuring how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they're going to do better in a layered landscape like this, where you have a tree, there may be a dogwood, native azalea, ferns, ground cover. There's leaf litter in there. It's soft landing. The caterpillars fall down. The ground is not compacted, and that, so far, the data suggests that's the major factor, keeping it from being compacted. Nobody's going to mow it. Nobody's going to step on them. They can easily get underground, pupate, or spin a cocoon in the leaves there. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. You put big beds around your trees. The bigger, the better. Your trees will love it, and it creates safe sites for those caterpillars. Use the uh, native ground covers that we have, a lot of them. Use them liberally. Things like wild ginger, native pachysandra, there's Virginia creeper, golden seal, mayapple, foam flower, ferns, lots and lots of choices. You know, if you can see the ground, you don't have enough plants. Green mulch, <laughs> green mulch is much better than any, anything else. Your trees will love it and so will those caterpillars. So how do I create, how do I take my, my big lawn uh, yard and, and create these big um, flower beds? Well, you can start in the fall, just put your leaves there, rake them all there and, and you're gonna start to suffocate that, that uh, grass. If you don't have enough leaves, steal some from your neighbors they put them in big bags out as if they were trash, take them and then pile them on there. And then in the spring, just plant right through it. That's, it's a fast, easy way. It's much better than digging up your grass because you always lose a lot of, of uh, topsoil when you do that. Okay, another former grad student, Desiree Narango, has done some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And her study suggests there's actually room for compromise in our plant choice. She had one simple question, how well the chickadee populations do in residential landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus residential landscapes dominated by typical introduced ornamentals. And when they're dominated by ornamental, introduced ornamentals, they have 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you've reduced the amount of bird food by 75%. They're 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So the, every, every yard has a nest box up in it, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to breed. If they did try to breed, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took 1.5 days on average longer to reach maturity. And if you put all those numbers into a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of non-native plant, woody plant biomass in your yard, from zero to 100%, this is what you get. We focused on woody plants because that's where chickadees forage. The dotted line here represents replacement rate. That is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live that long. And if you reproduce at that rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, anything above the line over here, you've got a growing population, and that happens when you have very few non-native plants. Uh, but if you have fewer babies than adults die, all this blue area over here, and that happens when you've got a lot of, of non-native woody plants, uh, then you have an unsustainable shrinking population. Now right here is where those lines intersect. So liberally speaking, you can have up to 30% of your non-native woody plant biomass now, of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. That's the area of compromise I'm talking about, which is great because if, I, if my message was you can't have any non-native plants at all, there wouldn't be 700 of you sitting here uh, because we love our, our non-native plants. We can't tolerate any of those invasives. They really are ecological tumors that escape and, and castrate our local ecosystems. But a lot of our ornamental plants, like camellias, you know, a lot of them are not invasive. They're not moving around. Things like ginkgo. Did, this is, we're back to Dan Getman. Did you recognize that that's a ginkgo in, in Dan's native plant landscape? Why does Dan have a ginkgo in his native plant landscape? Because Dan's wife likes ginkgos and asked him to put one in. 
the question is, is that ginkgo destroying the productivity of this landscape? No. Is it going to escape and wreck the woodlot? No. It's just there. So I like to think of, of plants like that as if they're statues, not really contributing anything. So there. <clears throat> Now, if every one of Dan's plants were a statue, you'd get it. That's not so good, but it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of those contributors, those, those highly productive native plants. If we increase the percentage of them, we can tolerate a lot of non-natives. Can we use native plants formally, in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design. You don't get more formal than that. That picture was taken by a drone 400 feet up, and every plant in that landscape is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. <laughs> can we get a pollinator garden into a, a, a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Just put a little fence around it. <laughs> it formalizes it. It tells your neighbor that it's not a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It's pretty when it's in bloom. It's meeting the needs of several species of pollinators. Could be bigger, uh, but if everybody did it, it would help. Help what? Help our pollinators. Why do we need pollinators? The media will tell you because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's really about a twelfth of our crops. And unfortunately, I hear people say, well, I, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators, and we need them everywhere because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Losing our pollinator is, an, is, is simply not an option. How about this? Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported over here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota's been doing it for several years now, a cost-sharing program that encourages residents to shrink or replace their lawns with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. Very popular. Pennsylvania has a similar program now. There's an island off of Florida that's paying people to uh, allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. Burrowing owls are listed species. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it, rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a, put a bounty on these, these invasive ornamentals like calorie repair. And, and, you know, it's happening. St. Louis, Missouri had a bounty on them. Fayetteville, Arkansas did. Uh, South Carolina has, has banned them, I think. North Carolina's got a bounty on them. You take out a calorie repair, you get a free tree replacement. Uh, utilities. What are utilities? You're giving people $100 coupons to plant uh, low water adapted native plants, water efficient native species, rather than the thirsty non-natives. And of course, the big lawn replacement programs in the far west, particularly California. This has gone up. You now get $3 for every square foot of lawn that you remove, $3 rebate, and replace with azeric planning. And if you want more information on all of those programs, memorize that. All right, I think we made three missteps in, in the, the early years of conservation, and it's still the early years of, of conservation. And the first one's um, serious. We start to think of nature as if it's optional. We like nature. We like to hike in it, ride our bikes, watch the birds, but it's not essential. And if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, which is always, nature takes a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, save nature, so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for, for expanding the na national park system. They're beautiful places, we want to save them so the future generations can enjoy it. And I understand that because nature is enormously entertaining, but it is much more than that. We need nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. We've also uh, talked about uh, how we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. But if we restrict conservation just to areas where there's not a lot of humans, we're going to fail because those areas are too few and too isolated uh, and too small. David Quammen has an excellent uh, analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That is 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that 
is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I don't like that language because it suggests there's places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. There's certainly places where we've destroyed the ecological significance, uh, but not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We've got to put the plants back, not just to create biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to recreate viable habitats where they once were. This is starting to happen. It is starting to happen. And when it does, it's going to be the first time in modern history where we humans actually did coexist co with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why. Because every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of local ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody share the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We've been very good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. More and more people recognize the earth has some serious problems uh, and they want to do something about it, but they all feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can use keystone plants, one person can modify their light system, one person can fire Mosquito Joe, one person can, did I say shrink the lawn, put in a pollinator garden, remove their invasive species. There's plenty that one person can do right where they live and totally revitalize their little local ecosystem, which then contributes to greater ecosystems rather than continuing to detract from it. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just think about the piece of the, of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate, and then ultimately our own. I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. I don't know, what do you, what do, you do? <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, I think we have time for questions, right? Yeah, Doug's, yep. gonna, Doug's gonna do a few questions and I'm just gonna do a really, a couple quick reminders now that all our minds are blown, right? As you leave today, we have 500 baby oak seedlings that we want to send out into the world, so please take a oak home when you leave. Please look for the petition that we have out in the halls in a couple places asking our local garden centers and nurseries to stop selling invasive plants. We can all do that. And I hope you've gotten one of the seed packets out there. We're spreading the pollinator mix that the, seed, the kids decorated those seed packets. So do those things and we'll let Day, uh, Doug answer some questions for you. Okay, um, I'm really old and decrepit and I can't hear very well, so speak up. Okay, there, there's, there's tent caterpillars in the spring, there's bagworms in the fall, they're both native plants. Is your question, what do we do about it? Yeah. We enjoy them. 
you know, um, they have found a good way to protect themselves. And there's some birds that have figured it out, like yellow bill and black bill cuckoos specialize on those guys. They rip open those tents and eat everyone. Uh, but most of our birds haven't. And, and so the only reason we don't like them is because they have tents and they remind us of spiders and they're ugly. And, but they all turn into adults. And that is what bats eat at night. When you want to help the bats, you've got to have moths that are flying around. That, that's true for the, uh, all the night jars, the whippoorwills and the chuckwills widow. They're all disappearing because we've gotten rid of all those guys. So tolerate them, please. Yes. Okay, how do you learn about caterpillars and, and butterflies and moths and all those things? We should do a guidebook. There are guidebooks. Um, Dave Wagner's Caterpillars of Eastern North America. He's working on caterpillars of Western North America, and he has been for the last 15 years, but he'll be done soon. Um, there's there's uh, uh, Seabrook Lecky and, and David Biddle's um, field guide to moths of of the northeastern U.S. and now the southeastern U.S. where they have pictures of the moths in, as they look when they're alive, not spread. Uh, and those are, those are both really good resources for identifying a moth that you, you catch. Now keep in mind there are 12,000 species of moths out there that are identified and another 2,000 that aren't. So it is pretty easy to find one that may not be all that, that common. But there's also something called the Moth Photographers Working Group um, in uh, Mississippi, you go on that website, and again, pictures of just about every species of moth that we know in this country, uh, in their living state, so you can flip through and, and try to identify them. It's, it's, I'll, I'll warn you, it's addictive, so watch out. Uh, somebody in the back, yes. You know who runs HOAs? People. We are people. Join your home homeowners association and educate them. They are concerned about one thing, losing property value. So what we need to do is convince them we can landscape ecologically without decreasing landscape or, or property value. Uh, that takes a little bit of education. You know, they're, they're doing what they've always done. But uh, I'm, I'm, I've been saying this for a while, and now I'm getting emails from people that say, I did it, I joined my HOA, and they're changing the rules. So, you know, they're your neighbors. They're your neighbors. You, we, this is called grassroots education. And, you know, I know a couple of good books that you could give to them <laughs> that explains all of it. <laughs> what else? What is my thought about using green light bulbs? I have no thoughts. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen any research on that. They always talk about you know white versus and blue being very attractive. Yellow, the warm wavelengths, not. Nobody talks about green. I have no idea. Okay, okay, green. Go for it. <laughs> yes. Are we, are we trying to reach landscapers? Uh, yes. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've talked to the uh, landscape architect national meetings a couple times and landscape designers. Are there any landscape designers in this audience? See, they often come. Um, so that's starting to happen. And you know what's driving it is the public's starting to ask for it. When, you, when there's a market there, people will respond to it. Um, and that goes for the nursery industry, too. Uh, let's see, I've just lost my train of thought. Senior moment. <laughs> um, I, you know, I've been talking about this for almost 20 years now, and I do see the needle moving. So uh, it seems like nothing's changing, but it really is. It is changing. So, uh, and it's, look at the interest here today. I don't know why you're here. You're
Be because you're interested, and that is what is, is changing the culture, and that is what will change the markets. That's what's going to change what's available in all of the nurseries, including Home Depot, if we stop buying the stuff that we shouldn't be buying. Um, so it is, it's happening. it's happening. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Developers. That's who we really need to talk to as developers. And actually, National Wildlife Federation has a good relationship with a major developer whose name, Taylor Morrison, I think that's it. They build in 17 different states, and they're building exactly the way we say. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a big name that's actually uh, cutting edge now. I see it as the future of development. So the, it really is starting to change in a big way. So, yes. Well, that, you know, the, the Desiree Narango study that I talked about, what happens to the chickadees, she started by counting all, all the insects in the yard. That, believe it or not, is the only study that has been done looking at the, the relationship between the types of plants you have in your yard, the insects, and the birds that depend on them. So that, and that was a big NSF-funded study, took five years, $400,000. It's hard to do this stuff, uh, but it's there, and it worked. Yes. Uh, gee, I don't know. Talk to your neighbors. Um, how, do we, how do you people spread the word? One thing you can do is make your landscape a model so that not that you're fined by your homeowners association, but that everybody says, I want that too. Um, that works really well. Then, you know, it's the, it's the quiet, the soft sell. You're not, you're not telling your neighbor they're living wrong. You're just, a, you're, you're showing how, uh, how much life could be in your yard. I've had, had people tell me, you know, they, they put in some, some gardens and all the butterflies come and all of a sudden they're known as the, the butterfly lady on the block and all the kids go down there. These are all selling points to people. So that's one, th one thing to do, be a good model. There were some other ones, yes. <laughs> well, there's a good argument for planting vegetables too, you know. <laughs> Locally grown food is great. You can control what's on it, less transportation. I don't want to say we're going to get rid of our gardens, um, but it's a, diff it's a different subject. So you, you, you are allowed to have native plants in a garden unless you have really small space and the garden needs full sun. So, um, you know, life is full of trade-offs and that's one of them, but I don't want to discourage home gardening. That's, that's valuable. So. Yes. The best tree for the chickadees is the one that makes the most caterpillars, and the one that makes the most caterpillars is one of the oak trees. Good question. Yes. Yeah, how are we doing? Well, one thing we're doing is, as these headlines are making an impact, people do care about this, and they're starting to care a little bit more. The cat issue is a serious one. You're right, three billion birds killed by cats every year, um, feral cats, or the cat you just, you just let outside. Um, cars kill another hundred million. Um, what's another big uh, bird kill? Window, yeah, window, window is another billion. So yes, what we do uh, is is clobbering the, the poor birds, but recognizing that is, is step one. So you know there are more and more products out there. We need to change our building codes so that we actually have the non-reflective glass, so that the birds don't think it, you can fly right through it. Um, 
there should be no new buildings without out there. There's a lot of should be's out there, but uh, if we continue as we're going right now, yes, you're going to continue to see bird declines. That's what it boils down to. So, yeah. Unless we boost bird reproduction to the point where they start to compensate better. You know, in the, in the boreal forest, when there's a spruce budworm outbreak, many of the warblers that go up there, like the bay-breasted warbler, they normally lay maybe four or five eggs. If there's a spruce budworm out, outbreak, they'll lay eight eggs, and they'll bring all of them through to maturity because there's so much food there. So they compensate. If we can increase the amount of food, we can help to balance some of these, these things. But we got to keep the cats inside and do all the other stuff. Yes. Okay, if you, like the native plant finder, for example, is all at the genus level, and that's because that's the quality of the data that's out there. If you look in the literature, what does this caterpillar eat? It often says oaks, but doesn't tell you which oaks. Um, so that's, so rather than lose a whole lot of data and only take information on the species that were listed, we did it at the genus level. But there's, um, there's good reasons to think that if you are adapted to eating one member of a genus, uh, you've got a high probability of being able to eat other members. It doesn't mean there's not variation within a genus. We compared 16 species of oaks and the herbivory on them, and the only ones that underperformed were the ones that were planted out of range. Otherwise, they were all uh, pra you know, practically the same. A slight edge for the white oak group but not enough to make a difference. So um, knowing that you have a productive native genus. Now, you can't use a non-native member of that genus because that's going to reduce uh, productivity. So there are non-native oaks. Don't use the quickest Sagittaria from China or the, or the, you know, the king's oak, Quercus robar. We've got 91 species of oaks in this country. We can find one that works for you. So. I can carry this around. <laughs> Hedgerows, extremely important. You know, there, there, there are four reasons that biodiversity has crashed in, in our agriculture areas. Is there feedback or something? Okay. Sneeze, sorry. Uh, and getting rid of hedgerows is one of those. So we've gotten rid of hedgerows. Uh, in the, you know, the giant mega farms in the Midwest, they got rid of them because the big machines bump into them or whatever. But then it became this farm ethic. We're just going to get rid of all of our hedgerows. Um, that was a big mistake. Hedgerows are extremely valuable place for pollinators, for much of the wildlife. Uh, and they are, you can use those big machines if you just place the hedgerows in the right place. But you can't have this hedgerows comprised of all the non-native plants. And that typically is what's happening. Autumn olive and all those things take care of the hedgerows. Unless you manage it in the hedgerows, they're not going to be productive. We did measure that. 96% loss in caterpillar biomass in hedgerows that are invaded by non-native plants. So then it goes to you know practically zero. Um, so keep them native, be big, uh, a big addition. Right now, the edges of our farm fields are long. We spray Roundup right up to the road, get rid of the weeds, which is milkweed and, and, and you know, Joe Pye weed and all of the, the native plants that are the host plants for the, uh, all the, the um, native bees, the 4,000 species of native. We get rid of all that, replace it with lawn that we then have to mow, and then we wonder why the monarch crashes, which is now red listed, by the way, uh, why we have declines in all of our, our bees. We simply got rid of what they were depending on. Those animals coexisted with agriculture for 150 years, no problem at all, before we got rid of those roadside weeds. So put the weeds back, um, add pollinator strips, a lot of research in, in Iowa showing how valuable they are, not just in, in helping pollinators, but because they, uh, if you put them perpendicular to the flow of water on your, your farmland, it intercepts 96% of the topsoil loss and 90% of the pollution huge benefits to doing that, and it's supported by CRP, USDA funding. And reduce the level of neonicotinoid. Our seed coatings, which do not increase yield, which means we are using them for nothing, 
are coated with neonicotinoids that are 7,000 times more toxic to insects than DDT was. 95% of that material washes off the seed into our watersheds and or is blown away on, on dust. So it's, you know, it's just like the fogging. We're doing it for nothing. What else? Yes. Yeah, what do we do about carpenter bees? You know, they love soft wood. They love, you know, if you build your deck out of, out of uh, redwood, they love that. They love soft, untreated pine. Um, yeah, it's another one of these judgment calls. They make very round holes. It's interesting. <laughs> but if you put up, give them an alternative. Make a nice little railing for them out in, in the yard with an untreated piece of, of pine. Encourage them to go over there. <laughs> Are we done? Wait, wait. Yes. Oh. Well, we can stop bringing them in. That would be good. You know why we have stink bug, brown marmorated stink bug? Oh no, I'm thinking of the uh, the uh, spotted lantern fly. You know why we have spotted lantern flies? They their egg masses are white. And we have them because we brought in ornamental white rocks from Asia. And we brought in ornamental rocks from Asia because there are no ornamental rocks in all of North America. <laughs> so now we got the spotted lanternfly. Um, you know, some of our invasive insects are just terrible. The hemlock woolly adelgid, the gypsy moth, which is now the spongy moth, the emerald ash borer, just clobbering our biodiversity. Uh, what do we do about it? You got to try to control them, but it's, you know, that you create a big problem and then try to fix it. It's much better to, to, to not bring them in to begin with. There is a little help, little hope with ember lash borer. Um, some of the parasitoids are starting to work. I haven't heard any good news about hemlock woolly adelgid. The brown marmorage stink bug spiked and is, and is uh, then kind of falls off on its own. Nobody knows why. Um, I had I had brown marmorated stink bugs inside the, the uh, heating element of my oven on Thanksgiving Day. I had them between the two sheets of toilet paper behind my, my, my uh, picture frames. Uh, but now, you know, we've got a few here and there, but they're not nearly the, the problem. So some things will correct themselves. Yes. Invasive onion things. Um, that's, that's wild onion, right? Yeah. I think I, you're, it's being suggested that you eat them all. One more question. Yes. All right, let's just talk generally about the different plant diseases we have. And right now the diseases hitting our oaks are really, really serious. We've got bacterial leaf scorch, we've got oak wilt. In the west we've got, we've got um, sudden oak death syndrome, which I heard today is, is here as well. They're clobbering the oaks, but for all of these diseases, and that is true for the anthracnose, there is resistance in the populations. So rather than try to save susceptible genotypes, where you will probably fail and you'll spend a lot of money doing it, it is better to, to um, look for plants that are not dying from these diseases and get those genotypes into the, into the population. Um, I know it's hard to lose a 150-year-old oak, but it's susceptible and you're not gonna save it. I, you know, I know your arborist wants you to spend a lot of time and money doing that, but uh, it is much better to find the, the oaks that aren't dying. I've got it on my property. I've already lost a couple black oaks, but I've got several that are, that are fine. And they're the ones that are going to make the acorns, and, and the jays will disperse them. So that's the future. That goes for ashes. It goes for, for uh, I don't know if we have any resistance with hemlock or not, but, but that's the future. Trying to, to cure the diseases. Uh, give up on that. Thank you very much, everybody.
Doug is going to be in the library signing books. You guys, there's, we've still got some books available. And lots of plants. And make sure to take your oak tree out with you when you go. Thank you guys so much.